order, and it's time for questions to the Minister for Social Development. And we'll start with listed questions. I call Mickey Brady. Um, Mr. Speaker, currently I have no such plans. Um, my department commissioned research from the Universities of Ulster and Cambridge to review the current allocation system, to look at best practice elsewhere, and to bring forward recommendations. One of the com recommendations is for choice based letting. My department is currently seeking views on this and the other recommendations at a series of public events. The academics recommend choice-based letting on the grounds of its success both in Great Britain and in the Republic of Ireland in promoting consumer choice, shortening relet times, reducing refusals and improving tenancy sustainment. I will, however, wish to hear further evidence and the views of stakeholders before bringing forward any policy proposals. I call Mr Brady for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. At committee level, all parties agreed that this would, would not be feasible, particularly given the uh, nature of housing here in the north. And will, will the Minister agree that it will not work in areas of high demand? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's important to look at things on the basis of evidence. Uh, this report was produced by uh, independent academics. Um, it was commissioned by myself, but it was undertaken by the academics. It's important that we look at what they have produced after a detailed analysis of the market elsewhere and what can be done elsewhere. It's one of a number of suggestions that they have uh, in their report. But what we need to do is talk to stakeholders, talk to a range of interest groups, look at the evidence and then make a judgment on that. I wouldn't want to make a judgment until I had seen all of the evidence. And as yet, I haven't seen that. Could I just point out also that uh, there are regions in uh, GB where there is also high demand, and it seems to work there. But I have no view either way at this present time. I'm simply seeking views so that I can formulate an opinion in due course. Sir Patsy McGlone. Uh, Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Um, will the Minister give assurances to this House in regard to whatever lettings are taking place that in those lettings the principle of need will be at the very core of the lettings of any properties and the process itself will be fair, open and transparent? Um, I can indeed assure the Member of um, both those points. Um, the allocation of housing should be on the basis of need. That is absolutely fundamental. And secondly, the system should be clear, transparent, uh, and fully uh, understood. We need a system that is fair and is seen to be fair, and that is what I am determined to ensure happens as we move forward. I call Mr. Mervyn Story. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And apologies to the Minister for not being present just for the, the first question that was asked. But could he maybe explain and maybe expand a little bit further for us as to why he felt that it was time for such a, fund, a fundamental review of the allocations? The, the current allocation system has been in place since the year 2000, so it's been in place 14 years. Uh, and I think, therefore, the time is right after that period of years for a review of how the scheme is operating. The current system has many shortcomings, including a lack of transparency, perceptions of point chasing and queue jumping, and also a very high level of refusals. So there are weaknesses in the current system. The current system asks applicants to specify areas of choice at a very local level, the common landlord area. And that often is only a number of streets. This can, in effect, restrict people's choices, lead to unrealistic expectations about when they might be housed, and exclude people from being considered for properties adjacent to their area of choice, which possibly could be suitable. And I think the fact that um, a number of academics from here and from GB who have looked at this uh, brought forward a series of recommendations suggests that, indeed, uh, it was timely to look uh, at a review of the allocation system. 
Thank you, and I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Question two, Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Department did not declare any underspends in the social housing development programme in the monitoring rounds this year. The programme is on target to deliver all of the planned units for 2013-14, and in fact this target may well be exceeded. The Northern Ireland Housing Executive, however, was able to realise efficiency and other savings within the Bamford aspects of the programme and declared these to the Department in the last January monitoring round. These funds, I'm glad to report, have been successfully utilised by the co-ownership scheme to enable applicants to purchase a home and also thereby to help the wider economy and the construction industry. I call Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, uh, for his answer. Is he considering any changes to, to policy or the implementation of policy that would uh, make provision uh, even more effective? Um, in, indeed, uh, I am looking at how the social housing development programme is delivered, because we are delivering on target, but I want to go beyond the target and see what more we can do to ensure the delivery of uh, more social houses. Um, there are a number of pieces of work that have been undertaken and are being undertaken. First was the PEDU report, which was conducted in terms of the delivery of social housing. Um, the second is that uh, we've been working there to identify um, the issues that were brought up in the PEDU report. Many of those have already been implemented. Some are being implemented at the moment. Then thirdly, uh, we're looking at what are the issues that are identified by housing associations as an obstacle to them delivering more. And there are a range of issues there that have been uh, brought up uh, as potential um, difficulties, sl slowness around planning, um, issues around site acquisition. Uh, those are, are major issues. Sometimes issues around the provision of water and sewage supplies to sites. Um, the, the capacity of housing associations to deliver and just in the last number of days, I've come across examples that have been brought to my attention of housing associations identifying themselves as undertaking a scheme, having been allocated the scheme, and then at the last minute pulling out because they did not have the capacity to deliver that scheme. So there are a number of issues there, and officials are working to ensure that we get a more efficient and effective delivery mechanism uh, that is better tuned, fit for purpose, and therefore we go even further beyond our targets. I call Ms. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his very detailed answer there. Can the Minister inform the House how many social houses have been delivered since he took ministership in 2011? Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, again, thank the Member for the question. My Department is responsible for implementing the current programme for Government's commitment to deliver 8,000 new social and affordable homes by 2015. By the end of the last financial year, we were well ahead of target, with 4,389 new homes already delivered, and of that figure, 2,789 are for social housing. The plans are to deliver a further 1,275 social houses this year, and plans that I approved in December will see 2,000 more start next year. So the programme for government target will be indeed achieved. I call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, Minister, uh, is it not the case that uh, the, the quota, if you like, for s social housing new bills uh, is not actually the most challenging and has been reduced in the past two years? And could I ask, Minister, have, have you or would you consider a special task force to address the dire housing waiting lists in uh, different parts of Northern Ireland? Um, first of all, um, the target was set by the Northern Ireland Executive and is one that was uh, endorsed right across the board as part of the programme for government. It is therefore one that we are achieving. I'm glad to be able to report that. But what I want to do, as I indicated in answer to a previous uh, supplementary, is to go beyond that. And there are a number of weaknesses in the current delivery system, which I've identified a few of there. But there are others as well. Um, for example, I, I 
give a very specific example of a housing association that had a scheme half finished but could not finish it off for virtually six months because there were issues around the uh, water and sewage connections for the houses. Now, that is unacceptable that you have that sort of delay. There are issues around site acquisition for housing associations, which is why we have, in a sense, front-loaded the system this year by ensuring that there was a substantial amount of site acquisition at the end of the financial year so that we can move forward into the next year with the sites already acquired. And it's that sort of forward planning. It's also the issue there around the capacity of our housing associations, because a number of them, uh, are quite a number, are not really involved in house building or simply maintaining their existing stock. The numbers of houses that are being delivered are largely being delivered by about five housing associations out of the whole range, and those housing associations are right at their limit. We need to see how we can ensure that there is greater capacity in the system. And uh, that's why I've been doing the work, not only the PEDU report, but all the other issues that uh, I mentioned, a few of there. Um, and we're looking very closely to see what can be done to speed up the system so that we can achieve a lot more. As regards uh, a task force, I think rather than setting up a task force, we've already done the analysis of how we could deliver more. And uh, that's now being worked on to see that we uh, address the issues that were identified. I call Mr Samuel Gardner. Thank you, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker, question number three. The Housing Executive has advised that at the 5th of January 2014, the current level of rent arrears was £11.3 million pounds for uh, domestic dwellings. Mr Gardner, for a supplementary. Th uh, I thank the Minister for his very direct uh, answer to me, but can the Minister tell us what proportion of rent, uh, rent arrears owned by, to the Housing Executive are comprised of individual arrears at a high level, and what percentage of their tenants is in arrears, in arrears have agreed budget plans with the Housing Executive? Um, those very uh, detailed points that the member is raising, I do not have to hand uh, in terms of the, the actual figures, um, but I am more than happy to provide those to the member. Um, but I, I wouldn't have that detail of figure uh, with me and available today. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the welfare reform issue and the non-implementation of that has implications not just for benefit recipients but for non-benefit recipients. Can the Minister outline what the extent of the uh, rent arrears problem is in the private sector where welfare reform in terms of be uh, housing benefits has already uh, been carried out? Um, the, the, the member raises, I think, a, a, an interesting point there because private rented sector tenants have already experienced housing benefit changes. Uh, this was prior to all of the changes that are coming at the moment. This was back several years ago in April 2011. So we're almost three years on from that. Changes included at that time how local housing allowance rates were calculated and the introduction of a shared accommodation rate for single people uh, aged 34 and under. Research that was carried out on the housing impacts of welfare reform in the private rented sector uh, was carried out by Sheffield Hallam University, published in late uh, part of last year. This research showed that despite the changes implemented in the private sector through those earlier reforms, few claimants surveyed were in arrears. Those that were in arrears stated that those arrears were caused by a change in circumstances rather than the changes to housing benefit. And they indicated that they had been able to uh, meet the shortfall by reducing expenditure in other areas. Uh, and in fact, there was evidence that the changes introduced at that time had the effect of driving down rents in the private sector because landlords uh, were particularly willing to reduce rents for um, existing claimants. And there's also evidence which indicates that of those affected, most people are simply managing their money differently. So the anticipated uh, level of difficulty that there might have been in the private rented sector has not necessarily materialised. Thank you. And I call Ms Sandra Overend. Question number four, please. My department does not hold the information on the number of houses repossessed each year in Northern Ireland. However, the Department of Justice issues statistics on the number of writs and summonses uh, issued for mortgage, repossession or mortgage possession actions on a quarterly basis. 
Those statistics show that the number of writs and summonses issued in 2010 was 3,903. In 2011, 3,588. 2012, 3,732. And up to September of last year, 2,899. 3,004 cases were disposed of by the courts in 2010, 2,698 in 2011, 3,157 in 2012, and up to September 2025. It should be noted that not all cases disposed of result in possession orders or result in the enforcement of that order to evict the householder. For example, in some cases, an arrangement may be agreed between the householder and the lender. Furthermore, lenders granted possession orders by the courts have up to 12 years in which to enforce the order. Therefore, the number of possession orders granted in any given year may not actually translate into the number of enforcements or indeed evictions. Thank you. And I call uh, Sandra Overham for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Indeed, behind every one of these three possessions is an individual or a family many having suffered the trauma of having their homes taken away from them. At a time when the executive uh, continues to squander money left, right and centre, does the minister still believe a mortgage rescue scheme like the one in England, Scotland and Wales would be too expensive? Well, I, I'll pass over the general criticism that the uh, member directed towards every department including her colleague's department in the uh, rural development and um, indeed the point has been made that it was probably especially directed at the department of her colleague Mr Kennedy. I'm sure will be very upset by the uh, criticism from, from the member in his own party. Uh, he'll, he'll be deeply hurt by that. Um, the, I do have sympathy for the concept of a mortgage rescue scheme. But in reality, I, I believe that it would either help only a small proportion of those facing repossession and would also be extremely expensive to operate. It is estimated that a full proposed rescue scheme would cost more than £8 million over a two-year period and would only enable direct intervention for 72 rescues in each of the two years. So the numbers that would be addressed are extremely small. Those are all real cases that face a real situation, and I don't want in any way to minimise that or detract from it, but the numbers that you would be able to help are extremely limited. And I'm conscious that when allocating money, the executive has to weigh up all the needs and priorities for the people of Northern Ireland, whether it be education, health, or whatever. So the numbers that would be helped um, could be uh, extremely small. But nevertheless, uh, as the member will be uh, aware, we have set up the... Uh, Housing Repossessions Task Force to look at a whole range of issues in relation to repossessions. I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. August um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, and thank the Minister for his answer. And, uh, he has uh, mentioned some measures, a task force that he's putting in place. But could I ask the Minister um, if he has any, had any discussions uh, with uh, the financial sector uh, to uh, examine ways in which home, home owners and tenants can be protected from repossessions? Um, I think perhaps it, it would be helpful if I just set out what we are doing um, to help with repossessions issue. Um, the, the, um, the fact of the matter is my department can't resolve what is an underlying problem leading to uh, a range of problems leading to possible home repossessions. And I do empathise, I've said already, with those who find themselves in that uh, distressing situation with the prospect of court action. So I've said already, we've established the Housing Repossessions Task Force to investigate what the impact is, what might be done further, if there's possible possibility of doing something further. Uh, and indeed, uh, the member is looking at the goodwill and generosity of spirit of some of our financial institutions. 
Uh, I noticed he, he was always shaking his head there when, when I referred to those terms. Um, we've also, uh, we're trying to harness through that the experience, the expertise available from all the, the stakeholders to identify ways in which government and others could assist in alleviating uh, the problems. The first meeting uh, of that task force is scheduled indeed for uh, tomorrow uh, with the aim of producing uh, outline recommendations by the month of June. Um, so in, that's in addition to the funding we give to the Mortgage Debt Advice Service and of course there's the support for mortgage interest. So all of those things are in place at the moment and, and I would ask the member to, to um, bear with me whilst we get the response back from the task force. Seems to be a fondness for task force over there in that corner of the room. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses uh, so far. But in relation to uh, house repossessions, can the Minister tell us of the level of demand for the Mortgage Debt Advice Service and what it has achieved? The formal contract for the Mortgage Debt Advice Service commenced in May 2011, and since that time, the service has experienced the demand at a level well above that originally envisaged. In 2011-12, the service provided advice and assistance to 1,310 clients, directly preventing homelessness for 280 households and providing representation and advocacy services, such as negotiation with lenders and attendance at court for 804 clients. In 2012-13, it assisted 1,695 clients directly preventing homelessness for 434 households and providing representation and advocacy services for 774. In 2013-14, up to December, it assisted 1,126 clients, preventing homelessness for 249 and representation and advocacy for 490. So I think that gives some level of indication of the extent of the uh, work that is being done, the excellent work by the Mortgage Debt Advice Service. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Question five, please, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, over the period of the 16 months that the current boiler replacement scheme has been in operation, 10,103 homes have had their old inefficient boiler replaced. The scheme is not due to finish until March 2015. And by that time, we aim to have helped 24,000 homes replace their boiler. The pilot boiler replacement scheme, which was launched in June 2011 and finished on the 31st of March 2012, assisted 1,743 homes replace their boiler. Therefore, over the two schemes to date, we have helped almost 12,000 homes and made a significant difference to the energy efficiency in those homes. Mr. Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Today, I think we would also but right to welcome the, in, this initiative and put on record our thanks to the Minister and the ESD for uh, indeed going a long way to addressing fuel poverty. Can the Minister provide details on the amount of grant that has been paid out and the average cost of each installation to each property? Um, Thank the member, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for, for the question because it does help to give a better picture of the profile of the programme. 29% um, of the applicants received the maximum allowable grant of £1,000, and 39% received a grant of £700, 14% received a grant of £500, and only 18% received a grant of £400. The fact that a significant number, th almost 30 per cent, received the maximum allowable grant, therefore they were folk on lower incomes, uh, that indicates, I think, that the scheme is being directed to those uh, who are most uh, in need. The average cost of installations is, for oil to oil, £1,587. For oil to oil with controls, £1,853. For wood pellet, £1,522. Gas to gas, £1,908. LPG to gas, £2,212. LPG to LPG, £1,826. And oil to gas, £2,191. So the cost of the installation uh, is very much dependent on the type of change that the uh, individual chooses. Mr. Joe Byrne. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can the Minister state how many homes does he hope will be included in the scheme next year and what budget allocation is he hoping for to continue with the good work on the boiler replacement? The um, initial amount that was set aside for the scheme over the three-year period was um, £12 million. Pounds. And then uh, I was able to secure an additional £6 million pounds from the European Regional Development Fund. So the overall package over the three years is £18 million. Pounds. It's very difficult to tie an amount to a specific year because you have a, a process that may well span a number of months where people make an application, it's processed. They might then not even spend or uh, actually get the installation done for a number of months. Uh, th there can be a delay at the choice of the, of the applicant. So it's very hard for me to pin down what exactly would be spent in a particular 12-month period. But if you're looking at the overall period over the three years, it's £18 uh, million pounds, uh, that, that is set aside for that. Um, the total um, aim is to have 24,000 installations over the three-year period. So again, having to set an average figure because of the reasons I've already set out, it would be around 8,000 affordable or, or boilers installed for vulnerable households um, over that period. Mr. Ross Hussey is not in his place, so I call Mr. Ian Mullen. Question number seven, Kest of Rishakt. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Chairman of the Housing Executive, Donald Hoodless, has a wealth of experience in social housing. When I appointed him in November 2012, he took on an incredibly difficult job. And since then, he has shown his determination to put in place clear governance and assurance systems to tackle the issues and to make the organizational changes that are required to ensure that appropriate services are delivered to tenants along with value for public money. I do not forget that he has inherited some extremely difficult legacy problems and in response to these, he has worked clearly and methodically to identify all the issues, particularly around the whole area of contract management. He has and still is putting in place measures, procedures to deal with these and to reform the systems and processes and indeed the culture within the organization to ensure that these will not reoccur in the future. This is all within the parameters of good governance and achieving value for money. Confident that the chairman has demonstrated clear leadership in this regard and that he is taking the right steps to address what have been endemic and long-standing issues, uh, both procedural and cultural. Could you show? Thank the Deputy Speaker for, and the, also the Minister for his uh, quest, to answers to the question thus far. Um, I hear what the Minister says, but um, is the Minister still not aware that the Housing Executive have underspent in all aspects uh, of their housing budget at a time when growing waiting lists and pro problems with maintenance? Does the Minister not think, even in the light of what he has said about the, the, the Chair, that the Chair should resign on, on, in light of this? Well, as I indicated there, the, um, in answer to a previous question from uh, Mr Nesbitt, the underspends were not really in terms of the social housing development programme. Um, we, we're on target there. The issues arose primarily in terms of uh, maintenance, uh, plan maintenance and so on. And the fact is that the weaknesses in contract management by the housing executive have been the cause of those underspends. Because uh, in a number of areas, uh, work had to be put on hold because contracts were not properly management, managed previously and difficulties therefore arose, of which we are all aware. But those weaknesses in contract management by the housing executive actually go back many years. They go back eight, nine, ten years, and well before the tenure of the current chairman. I welcome the fact that the current chairman has acknowledged that there is a problem there, because there was a state of denial for a long time within the housing executive about the fact that contracts were being managed and monitored so badly. And then not also, he's not, uh, not only identified and acknowledged the problem, 
He is now putting in place the necessary measures to ensure that this sort of thing does not happen again. And I would say that both for the Chair and the Vice Chair that they brought a level of experience and expertise that was seriously wanting at that top level within the organisation. Thank you. And that brings us to the end for the, the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Robin Newton. Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Pr Principal Deputy Speaker. What is the Minister's view on the recent comments by the SDLP's Dolores Kelly on housing need? Yes. Well, uh, I thank the member for, for his question. Um, Mrs. Kelly made a, a statement which was issued there on the 15th of January in cooperation with the uh, PPR project, uh, which is a lobby group in the North Belfast. And she said, in the course of her contribution, she said, any objective analysis or examination of the facts, this was in the context of North Belfast, can come to only one conclusion that Catholics in need of housing are being discriminated against. Shame. Shame. The conditions that the people of North Belfast have been subjected to are intolerable, she said, and would not be accepted by any other functioning democracy. And to emphasize again her words, Catholics in need of housing are being discriminated against. And she went on to use the term, uh, she said, this is nothing short of 21st century gerrymandering. Now, I want to put on record today the actual figures for North Belfast. Not the myths that have been manufactured and peddled by the SDLP and by Republicans and by the dissidents who were out on the streets of Belfast on Saturday. I think about 50 of them turned up for their rally. But the truth of the matter is they have manufactured and peddled myths. The facts are these. There is no disadvantage. There is no discrimination. The waiting lists in the North Belfast constituency as of September last year were as follows. That the people in the uh, Protestant community, uh, there were 2,059 Protestants on the waiting list. There were 1,986 Roman Catholics. The waiting list in North Belfast was actually a list on which there were... No, no. And I, I'm glad that the member across the way has said figure the, from a side. The minister's but time is up. Accusing in that case, Mr. Deputy Speaker, accusing the housing executive of massaging figures because those are the housing executive's own figures. And if she wants to look at, I remain the minister. Two-minute rule. The minister's time is up. And let's address remarks through the chair as well. Well, I, I will happily do that. Indeed. The minister's time is up. Can I? Could, could, the minister, could the minister outline his investment in social housing in Belfast since he took up office? Well, I just want to take the opportunity in uh, addressing that to also address the housing stress figures in North Belfast. Because when you look at those, they weren't very much different. There were 821 Protestants in housing stress, 898 Roman Catholics. In other words, in a constituency like North Belfast, where you have roughly 50% of the community from the Protestant community and 50% from the Roman Catholic community. The need in both communities is roughly the same. It is not the level of disadvantage and discrimination that has been manufactured and invented, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by people like Dolores Kelly, who concocted these ridiculous figures and have thereby, I think, had a damaging and deep toxic effect on community relations in the north of the city. The truth of the matter is, these are the facts, these are the figures. And people like Dolores Kelly can, as much as they want, deny it, argue about it, dispute it, query it, calculate whatever they want to do. They can't get round the facts. These are the housing executive's own formally official figures that were presented and made public. Facts. See, there's an old saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. The truth of the matter is, Mrs. Kelly, like many others, simply cannot face up to the facts. They don't like facts, they prefer myths and they prefer invention. As regards the amount of money that has been spent on housing um, in Belfast, I, I have to confess I, I do not have that actual figure in front of me, but will be more than happy uh, to provide that figure uh, very shortly to the member. But thank him for his question and for the opportunity to rectify the falsehoods and the innuendos that some yeah. people propagate yeah. in this regard. Yeah.
Order, order. I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I understand that the Minister has recently become aware of a number of social homes that were constructed without cavity wall within their, their build, commonly known as Arlet Homes. Is the Minister aware of the extent of this issue and what he proposes to do in trying to address the problems of damp and condensation within these properties? Um, I thank the member for what is an important question. And that issue of single skin properties, which are particularly cold, very difficult to heat, and often affected by dampness, and there are a range of these that come to the figures in a moment, that's an issue that has been around for many years. And it's one that sadly was ignored by some previous incumbents in this particular department. It was an issue that was cast aside and ignored. It has now been identified. And uh, I'm very happy to put the figures there on record as to what the challenge is, but it's one that we're facing up to and working very closely with the housing executive and others in that regard. In terms of no fines properties, there are 5,296 single skin properties. In terms of orlets, there are 740. There are 615 easy form and 801 rural cottages. And there are also 3,444 pre-1940s terraced houses which are likely to be single wall construction. So you can see there when you total all of that up, you're actually getting up to around 10,000 properties that have single skin. And bearing in mind uh, the extent of the housing executive stock of uh, 90,000 properties, it shows the extent of the problem, the percentage within their stock. So as regards to what we're doing, uh, I could say that we have introduced uh, a, a piece of work taking that forward, which has been carried forward in Spring Farm Estate in Antrim, to look at the best way technically to, to deal with this problem. And uh, that is a piece of work which will not only shape our work here in the future to address the problem, but will also, because it involves people from right across the United Kingdom, it will also um, ensure that the lessons that are learned are applied right across uh, the United Kingdom. It's, it's a problem that is not unique to Northern Ireland, but it is a significant problem here, and I'm glad that we're now in a position where we're really getting to grips with it. We'll know what the work is, what the challenge is, what needs to be done, and we'll be able to take that forward. Thank you, and I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I'd like to put on record our thanks and appreciation to the Minister for his efforts in trying to address this issue. Does the Minister recognise, the, obviously, the difficulties that there are in relation to heating such homes? and the consequences of such, and does he have any idea when a programme of rectification may come into place for areas like Hollywood in North Down? Yeah. <laughs> um, the challenge in this regard is quite considerable, because if we look at examples of retrofitting that have been carried out um, elsewhere, for example, in, in various parts of Great Britain, the cost per property can be somewhere in the region of £15,000 to £20,000 to do a really good job on each property. And when you bear in mind the number of properties that need to be tackled uh, to address this problem and the cost per property, one can see very quickly with a calculation the cost that there will be, and it is something that will have to be done over a period of, of years. Um, but I agree entirely with the member that it is a major difficulty for people living in a number of these properties um, because they are having to spend a lot more in terms of heating those properties. It's unfair that they are having to uh, put out that amount of money to heat properties, um, and yet others uh, who are in housing executive properties or housing association properties that are much newer um, have a much more energy efficient home that costs a lot less uh, to heat. I visited a home in Liverpool which had been retrofitted very efficiently, and uh, the lady was commenting on the huge reduction in her, in her heating bill, and the fact that in fact, the previous eight weeks she hadn't even had a, the heating on. Uh, we've also visited recent examples in Germany to see what they're doing there, and there is a lot of work that can be done, I think, to improve the quality of life for the residents in those homes. Thank you, and I call Mr Basil McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister support the Committee for Social Development's attempt to get the original unedited report by the Campbell Tickle published? Well, my understanding is that that report is either with or on its way to the, the committee. It's been requested uh, by the committee. It is to be provided to them. And therefore, uh, I think that uh, the matter is, has been resolved in that way. 
Mr. McRae. Um, I'm not sure if that resolves the question, Minister. The question is, do you support their call for it? It's fact that it's going to happen. But I will ask you this question. On the 10th of June, you came to this House and announced that there was an overpayment of some £18 million, uh, likely to be a Conservative figure, I think you said. Do you regret rushing into the House at that time, given that the figures now seem to be considerably less than that? First of all, in, in terms of the uh, report uh, being provided to the uh, committee, it is not for me to either uh, hold back or inhibit in any way the, the work of the committee, and therefore it has made a request. It has received uh, or will receive very soon the, the document. As regards the um, announcement last year uh, in regard to um, maintenance contracts, um, what is clear from the Campbell to Kell report is this that the manner in which the housing executive drew up contracts, monitored them and managed them was deeply flawed. It is a pretty damning indictment in that regard as to the way in which the housing executive managed and monitored contracts. Um, it was not done properly. It was open to all sorts of difficulties that would arise. And that's one of the issues that goes back quite a number of years because the contracts were basically set up um, quite a number of years ago. Uh, in fact, I think it was just towards the end of the period of direct rule before the Assembly um, came into to operation again. So it's a thing that goes back a number of years. It's a problem that was there. It was endemic within the organisation, or institutional within the organisation, rather. Uh, and in that regard, um, I think we're in a better place now because the Campbell to Kell report has identified what the problems are and um, I think we can actually then move forward. Um, I think there are lessons to be learned. There's one thing that is very clear from it. I know one member who's a great fan of the housing executive there shaking her head, Mrs Kelly. The truth of the matter is it is a damning report because it does say there's actually a huge issue there in terms of the, the skills and the, um, the ability there, the, the methodology that was used to monitor these. This was a very hands-off managing. With the sort of thing you had then, it should not have been hands-off. It should have been very much hands-on. And I call Mr Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could the Minister update the House on the status of the double glazing contracts with the housing I have? Um, yes, indeed. I'm uh, glad to say that I've just been informed that those uh, housing uh, contracts um, have indeed been signed and that work can now move forward again with getting windows installed. The two things that I identified some time ago as being particularly relevant in terms of addressing energy inefficiency were, first of all, the issue of double glazing, and then secondly, the issue of uh, the, the uh, single skin properties. We're now back on track with uh, the double glazing, and as promised and committed to in the programme for government, by 2015 we will have all of the housing executive double, uh, single glazed properties, then double glazed, which is a much shorter time scale than that originally uh, envisaged by the executive. So we will be on target to get that work done. Yeah, yeah. Clark, for a supplement. I, I thank the Minister for that. I'm sure the general public will be pleased the double glazing programme is back on track. But given that there was a meeting some time ago with, uh, and a discussion around the Glass and Glazing Federation's uh, guidelines, can the Minister outline to the House what potential savings uh, that the Northern Ireland Executive will receive from that? The Housing Executive has advised me that in relation to the double glazing framework, the overall value of the three double glazing contracts awarded is around £23 million, and that this combined cost following the secondary competitions represents an average saving of around 21.5% when compared to the average costs in the previous contracts. So the attention that was focused on the Glass and Glazing Federation guidelines and the competition have brought us to the point where we now have a saving of uh, around 21.5%. We were originally told at the time that this would probably uh, bring a saving of £15 million. We now have uh, a figure that is uh, the actual figure. 21.5% saving is an excellent saving keeps more money in the public sector for spending within housing or wherever, and that's important. We need to deliver value for money because we are in a time of financial constraints, and if you can deliver a 21.5% saving, 
as a result of looking at the Glass and Glazing Federation guidelines, then I think that that was a wise decision indeed at the time. Yeah. And order. That brings the, uh, the, the period for topical questions uh, to an end. We must move on to questions.